Good morning. Good to see you. Uh, some of you did not get the Martin Luther notes from a few weeks ago. Holly has made some extra copies of Martin Luther if you need it. They'll be up here. Don't want to get them confused with the English Reformation where we are in the back. Um, today I'm going to share something with you to begin with that I've, I've always used, but I haven't used it with y'all yet, and that is my timeline of church history. You know, our goal uh, and our task that I've been given is to cover 2,000 years of church history in 12 lessons, which is, um, it, it, what's that song, to dream, the impossible dream? Well, that's really an impossible task. So if you're doing 2,000 years in 12 lessons, all you're doing is dipping down and dipping down. But we've gone far enough now, I thought I would give you kind of an overview this is a chart that Doug Fincannon and I came up with probably 25 years ago, and we've, in various forms, I've used it everywhere. And this essentially, arbitrarily, but essentially breaks the church down into three periods. You have the ancient church history, which includes the apostolic church. It includes the apostolic fathers like Polycarp. It includes the church councils, Nicaea, Chalcedon. It includes the golden age of church fathers, which is Augustine, which is all the preachers in Turkey that I couldn't go over like John of Chrysostom. They call him golden tongue because of his ability to preach. But that essentially falls between the formation of the church and we, I break it at 590 because Dr. Panosian broke it at 590. <laughs> and if you take your masters under someone, you tend to do what he did. But he justified the 590 because that's when Gregory came to the throne as Pope. Gregory was the, probably the first universally recognized Pope, even though the East didn't recognize him. So we break it and we start medieval church history from 590 up to the beginning of the arbitrary Reformation, 1517. Within that, the first medieval Pope, which was Gregory, the rise of the Holy Roman Empire, 800, the crowning of Charlemagne, the uh, Crusades, which I skimmed over, and I was chastised by someone who said they really were victories, but you have to explain why they were victories and failures at the same time. We didn't have time for that. The papacy went in decline. You had, pap you had popes in three different locations, and one of them wore a skirt. Uh, the pre-reformers, you had Wycliffe, you had Tyndall, you had Savonarola and Fall Lawrence. You had the Albigensians who were really not good, the Waldensians who were good. This all happened in the period of the 13th and 14th century. Then you come upon uh, the period of the 16th century and Martin Luther. We call this modern church history, the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, which we haven't even mentioned. Rome attempted to answer the Reformation by the Council of Trent and something that occurred and by the way, the doctrine that was firmed in the Council of Trent by Rome from 1545 to about 1572 has never been changed and never been altered. Whatever they said then, they essentially are saying today, even though they've tried to knock the corners off some of it and make it a little more palatable, what it is the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. Rationalism, revivalism, denominationalism arises in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, revivalism, missions, and modernism comes from the 19th and 20th century, and you get to where we are today. So we're going to have, I think, four more lessons after this. We're going to deal with the Puritans. We're going to deal with rationalism, revivalism. Then we're going to deal with missions. Then we're going to deal with where we are today. We will not deal with the rise of Reformed Baptists. We are really a subset of a subset of a subset. But uh, we're important, and we have a place, but we just don't have time to talk about it because it's not in the scope of what I've been assigned and for once in my life, I'm trying to follow directions. <laughs> and for y'all who know me, know that is not easy for me to do. So, uh, this morning we're going to come to the period that's called the English Reformation. Uh, we're going to study the English Reformation. We're going to slow down just a little bit. Because in the English Reformation, we find bits and pieces of who we are. And it helps us to understand where we are today. This period includes many of the people that we call our heroes, part of our own Christian family subtree with whom we're intimately connected. 
martyrs like Thomas Cranmer, Bishop Latimer, Bishop Ridley, Hooper, Bradford, whose sacrifices we're called, to, we're called to emulate and learn from. This period also will greatly help us. So we work out together, where do we go from here? You know, that's really the big question. The church is always in a crisis. The church has always been in tension. We may be in a little bit more crisis and a little bit more tension today. I know every generation wants to say theirs is the worst. But people that I really, really respect uh, who are astute theologians and historians and, in a sense, educated people say that what we're facing today may be unusual due to the scope of the problem, the complexity of the challenges of, to the church. Dr. Moeller says he cannot imagine that there's ever been a time like this and that the church is not in more crisis. But you know what? As I tell the dear pastors in Africa, I start in Matthew 16, and I tell them in Matthew 28 we have a challenge. In Matthew 16 we have a promise. The church will grow. We will be victorious. We keep that in mind to underlie everything we do. And we may be in crisis, and we are. And don't kid yourself There are not very many people in evangelical Christianity that are our friends. Certainly, they're not people in broad things that are our friends. But but we have the friend of all friends, and we will, God willing, be successful. As for you, I put the scripture at the top of the uh, handout. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result. Now, we know what Joseph was talking about there. What could we be talking about in the English Revolution, or Reformation, excuse me? What could someone have intended for evil but has ended up being good? I hope we'll see that in the next 40 minutes. Let's pray. Our Father, we gladly acknowledge that we're uh, without strength, we're without hope, Uh, All of our hope rests in you. Our strength comes from you. You've called us to believe, to respond in faith, to act in courage. But we depend upon you for anything that we do. This church, Father, is built on dependence of the power of the Holy Spirit and the gifts that he gives the Lord Jesus Christ, who is ruling and reigning on high now. We're thankful for that. As our children and grandchildren are instructed in the other classes, as we today come to consider these things, may we be undergirded by a a settled confidence in our sovereign God who loves us, who loves us, who loves us. What an amazing thought. Help us to understand. Keep me from saying things that are improper Help us to gather from this the lessons we need, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. The English Reformation. Uh, to begin the English Reformation, we have to begin with this corpulent fellow, one of the many uh, portraits of King Henry the Eighth. There are so many things could be said about Henry. Most of them probably shouldn't be said about Henry. And uh, being a child of the 60s and 70s and 80s, I have to forget that little monkey's tune about, I'm Henry VIII. I don't want to, I will not sing it. And I try my best to keep it out of my mind as I deal with Henry. Henry is a very unusual character. Henry's Reformation presents us with a historical problem. Historian, excuse me, historians argue bitterly over this question. Was the Reformation in England from the top down, otherwise at the instigation of kings and the nation's leading men, or was it from the bottom up? Was it a popular Protestant uprising? There's a historical problem with Henry. There is a moral problem with Henry. He was a notorious adulterer lecher, murderer, he started the Reformation in England. Huh? An adulterer, murderer, lecherous, deceitful old man started the Reformation? Yeah. 
What are we to make of this? Henry VIII rightly deserves history's harsh judgment as one of England's most reprehensible monarchs. He took multiple wives. Here's a picture of him and and his six wives. He took multiple wives. The fortunate ones he merely dismissed and divorced. He had two others put to death. Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. That's the way to think of Henry's six wives. I used to spend 10 minutes on them, and they're really interesting, but we don't have an, even 30 seconds this morning on them. Uh, his multiple wives, uh, he was the same scoundrel who defied the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. He laid the foundation for the Reformation to begin in the English church. As Christians, we need not shy away from these unsavory facts. Scripture and history bear numerous examples of God bringing good results out of, human, out of humanity's wicked actions. Genesis 50:20, which we've read, is a great Bible summary of this truth. It means we can condemn sin anywhere we see it, but we also remember that the Lord is in control. He can use wickedness to bring about gospel good. We better hope that he can. Henry's break with Rome occurred, um, oh, I, I think I do, I do put up a list of Henry's uh, wives. Uh, Catherine, who had a daughter, Mary, he divorced her. Anne Boleyn had a daughter, Elizabeth, he beheaded her. Jane Seymour had a son, uh, Edward, she died, bless her heart. Anne of Cleves, he divorced. Catherine Howard, he beheaded. Catherine Parr survived. So that's Henry's six wives. Let's go back to Henry here for a second. The story of the birth of the Church of England actually began in 1509 when Henry married Catherine of Aragon. Catherine was the wife of his dead brother, Arthur. At that time, such a union was thought immoral and it required special dispensation from the Pope. Only one child was born to that union, a girl named Mary. Crucially, there was no son. Henry sought to have the marriage annulled or canceled by the Pope. Several reasons. One, he wanted to maintain his dynasty, and he needed a son. The Tudor dynasty had only begun in 1485, with the victory of his father, Henry II, uh, VII, at the Battle of Bosworth. So the Tudors had not been on the throne very long, and you couldn't stay on the throne with a, a daughter. You needed a son. He desperately needed a son. Second, it seems Henry had genuine conscientious qualms about his marriage to Catherine. He feared that it might have contravened God's law in Leviticus 20, 21. And he didn't want to displease God. Third, and maybe most importantly, he was infatuated with Anne Boleyn. Pope Clement VII refused his entreaty for annulment. Uh, he mainly refused because he feared Catherine's nephew, who was Charles V, the, uh, 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 the uh, head of the Holy Roman Empire. Charles, frankly, had just sacked Rome. His soldiers had imprisoned Clement so you know Clement's not going to say, hmm, to the emperor's aunt? Don't think so. Uh, Henry's response to the pope was to rid England of the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. He used universities. He used parliament. He used his archbishop. His archbishop was named Thomas Cranmer. Cranmer... Uh, Opposed, helped him to oppose the Roman Church. 1553, Archbishop Cranmer annulled the marriage, which was, from one perspective, was just as well, since four months earlier, Henry had married the pregnant Anne Boleyn. Another one of those side stories we can't talk about. By the way, there's evidence that Anne Boleyn might have been a true believer, but again, that's way out there. Cranmer, uh, at this time, England, at 1553, began to think of itself differently than before. 
it was stated in the uh, the act of uh, suppression. Uh, it comes up. It was stated in there that this realm of England is an empire with no external ruler or authority. England was saying, we don't have an authority outside of us. I, I, I read that and go over it, uh, and I think about Brexit and all the problems, but that, that's another story. Henry's changes were to the authority, not the theology, uh, theology of the church. There was now to be one ruler over both spiritual and temporal affairs. In, eight, in 1534, the Act of Supremacy said that the crown was given total power over the church. The Church of England was born in 1534. Here's, there's a portion of that uh, Act of Supremacy that I've got in there, and I, I like the fact that our said sovereign Lord, his heirs and successors, etc., shall have full authority on the bottom, it says, to do the pleasure of Almighty God, the increase of the virtue of Christ's religion, and for the conservation of peace, unity, and tranquility. In essence, what Henry was saying in this thing said, Pope, you're out. I'm Henry, and I'm in. An older English histor- history book had this phrase in it. He was the king, the whole king, and nothing but the king. But he wished to be, with regard to the Church of England, the pope, the whole pope, and nothing and something more than the Pope. Henry saw himself as the head. And today, you know, the king of, or queen of England is the head of the Church of England. And their vows are supposed to be to uphold it. Of course, Charles um, changed the vows to uphold faith, not the faith, because he doesn't think there's only one. Almost no change was made to the doctrine of the church. At this stage, there was an English Catholicism without the Pope. There was nothing distinctively Protestant. Indeed, in 1521, Henry had actually written a book denouncing Luther and asserting Catholic Catholic doctrine and upholding the seven sacraments. Henry had not ceased to be a Catholic. Uh, But... In 1538, Henry called a, an abrupt to the minor reforms that he enacted. He was irritated by the pressure from the Lutherans on matters of doctrine. He was worried by a coalition against him of France and the empire. All, however, these changes to authority structures did make the future Reformation easier. The fact that the Church of England was set up the way it was and the authority was set the way it was, made it easier for reform in the future. Another factor of this period was the, and I've got it, oh, was the dissolution of the monasteries. This was not driven by doctrine, but by greed. Henry's great administrator, a man named Thomas Cromwell, had performed an audit. He discovered that the total income of the monasteries was three times larger than the income from the crown estates. We cannot imagine uh, the enormous power that these monasteries and really monks and nuns in these monasteries control. Imagine, they had three times the wealth that the sovereign had. He began in 1536 with minor monasteries. He spread it to the major monastic houses in 1539. Within a decade, around two-thirds of the monastic lands had been sold. Henry used the money to pay for wars because he was fighting the French, at at least the French at this time. Another key feature uh, of the English Reformation and the move that was happening right now is called the, the, the availability of the English Bible. William Tyndall... Uh, William Tyndall was a persecuted for pursuing his own unauthorized translation of the Bible. I wish I had time to spend on Tyndall. I have a, a paper on Tyndall that I gave in Africa 
And if anyone wants it, I'll, I'll be glad to send it to you. This little um, chart I did on Tyndall. Tyndall, uh, when he was um, serving as a tutor, uh, got into an argument with a local priest at dinner table. And he said to the priest, the priest was saying that you needed to listen to the Pope. Tyndall says, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life ere many years, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow shall know more of the scripture than thou dost, yet more than the Pope does. This was about probably 15, 23, 24, 25 when Tyndall wrote this. Tyndall had been to Cambridge, came into the truth of grace at the White Horse Inn in Cambridge. Uh, in 1526, Tyndall publishes his New Testament with a preface and notes. Someone called his preface Pure Luther. Tyndall had gone to uh, Germany, gone to the continent. He was martyred in 1536. He said on the fire when he was there, he said, Lord, open the eyes of the king of England. He spoke eight languages so fluently that it said that if you were a native of the country of that language, you would not know that he wasn't a native. The man was an absolute linguistic genius. He did all of his translation in in dark rooms, on the run, at threat of his life, but yet his translation was so good that over 85% of the, new, of the King James authorized version that some of you in here hold in your hand that was published in 1611, 85% of it was Tyndall's translation. They had 70 men working for three years on the authorized version, and they couldn't improve on what Tyndall did. The man was brilliant. Anyway, that's this thing I had on, but it is now coming off. I'm going to appeal to the authorities that be that I get the one that hooks on both sides next time. This is just, it's quite frankly disconcerting if you want to know the truth. Anyway, that's enough on Tyndall. Uh, Tyndall's, uh, go back to your notes, David. Go back to your notes. The English Bibles began to make their way back to England. They became widely used so that by 1537, Edward Fox, Bishop of Hereford, told his fellow priest, and it's in your notes, make not yourselves the laughingstock of the world. Light has sprung up and scattering all the clouds. The lay people know the scriptures better than many of us. Isn't it amazing what God will do with his word in the vernacular? You need the word in the vernacular. What does that mean? The word that can be understood by the people when they read it. That's why we update translations. We're not improving. We're just making it more readable. If we stay faithful to the Greek manuscript and to the text, the people need to understand what they read in the word of God. But the word of God is power beyond anything we can ever imagine. Let it loose. Let it loose. Under um, Cromwell's patronage, the Great Bible was produced in, in 1539. Henry approved this. Miles Cloverdale was the editor of this, but he took all of Tyndall's work. They made it into a, a Great Bible, and Henry paid for one to be printed and put in every cathedral and every church in England had one Bible. You could go to church and read the Bible. You have problems reading in the morning. What if you had to come here every day just to get to the one Bible? But they did. And you know what happened? The Word of God blew up. It blew up England. I love it. I don't love this. As for Henry himself, his own marital misery continued. He either married and divorced or killed four more wives until his death in 1547. Where did the pressure come from? Oh, excuse me. I don't need to do this yet. It's uh, in, in your notes. I, I've got things. I, I didn't put it up here. Where did the pressure come from to change? We've noted some pretty basic motives within Henry VIII's heart. But what of the other factors that have entered in at this time? There was some level of popular anti-clericalism, though historians argue about how much the general public 
was dissatisfied with their Roman Catholic clergy. A few faithful ministers had preached sermons blaming the clergy for the general spiritual state of lethargy in the country. There were objections raised to the practice called pluralism. Pluralism was when one man uh, was given the the see or the uh, the church in different areas. See, all of the churches most were supported by a patron. It had, pardon me. I'm neither a prophet or the son of a prophet, but I prophesy that next week I will not be wearing this one. (laughs) Pluralism was when one man, let's say uh, Bishop Bishop Jones Enzi, was given four different churches. And he had the income from these four different churches. Now he couldn't pastor them. He couldn't even preach in them, but occasionally, but he got the money for them. Uh, it, there was a bishop by the name Cardinal Woolsey. Uh, had so many, uh, I forget how many uh, churches were under him and how much money was coming in to the cardinal. The vast power of these men was great, and the people opposed it. It's not a straightforward picture. There was some evidence for a resurgence of popular Roman Catholic piety. Thomas Cromwell, who we mentioned before, his motivation is not clear. He was the administrator for the king. He was a humanist. Uh, He may have quietly followed the Protestant doctrines or may not. we, We know he was keen to throw off the medieval excesses and return to the original sources of the Christian faith. Thomas Cranmer, otherwise, the bishop, of, uh, of our, the Archbishop of Canterbury, quietly worked behind the scenes. He uh, led to other reforms. He was the great, pr- a clear Protestant, but he was unable to carry out the reforms. Followers of John Wycliffe, known as Lollards, remained in a few areas in the land. Lutheran doctrine, and this is a great thing, consider this. Lutheran doctrine wonderfully began to creep into Oxford and Cambridge universities. 1520, an Oxford bookseller was burned for selling 12 copies of Luther's work. Now, Luther had just started publishing in 1518, but by 1520, they had been translated into English and was available on the sly in in, uh, in, uh, uh, Oxford. At the White Horse Inn in Cambridge, I wish I'd have put you up a picture of that. It's, it's still there. There was a covert gathering of men. Known, the White Horse Inn was called uh, by Little Germany because what did they do? They read Luther. They studied Luther. A gentleman by the name of Robert Barnes uh, led this group. Protestant doctrine was discussed, was imbibed. That was where William Tyndall heard of grace was at the White Horse Inn. Miles Coverdale Little Thomas Bilney, Hugh Latimer, Thomas Cranmer, from the men that were in the White Horse Inn, served as uh, bishops and archbishops, and a number of them paid for their lives, with their lives. Something that should encourage us here. Now, uh, these are words I'm going to read you from Pastor Andrew Gray at uh, the Emmanuel Church in in, in, uh, England, because he's writing this to his congregation. So I'm just going to read it the way he put it. Something should encourage us here. Consider the fruit that the Lord often produces when believers gather together for a specific purpose. Church history bears countless examples of great movements of evangelism, intellectual life, or social reform that grew out of small gatherings of Christians for prayer, for fellowship, and discussion around a common purpose. The Lord does not necessarily call all of us to massive, world-changing revolutions. But it could be we are called to think and to pray deliberately with others about workplace evangelism, starting a new ministry, studying a particular idea. How 
we can stimulate one another to good deeds or good works, as it says in Hebrews 10.24. Can you think of things in your past where a few people gathered together and you began to discuss stuff and something began to burn in you? I better not mention a couple of things. I'm about to get choked up. Earl probably knows I'm thinking about it. Farmer's Dairy in, in Old Salem. Ooh, the discussions, bean soup and, and coffee that was held at those tables. And out of that, out of that, there's a man ministering in Kampala, Uganda this morning from the Farmer's Dairy. He's sitting here. I'm standing here. You don't know what happens here, but a few people, a few people seek truth and seek the Lord. It's a great thing. Well, uh, Henry dies in 1547. And then his son, Edward VI, who's nine years old, assumes the throne. He was the son of Henry's third wife, Jane Seymour. One of the mysteries of history is that Henry had permitted his son to have clearly prospered Protestant tutors. It seems clear that he was himself, uh, Edward, a sincere, convinced Protestant. He was likened by some to Josiah, the faithful boy king of Judah. When John Hooper was installed as Bishop of Gloucester, Edward noticed that the reference was made to the company of saints. He himself intervened to strike out the words. There's no company of saints because that's a Catholic phrase. He had two adult advisors. And they were known as protectors. He led the council that ruled. They led the council that ruled on his behalf. They were clear Protestants. And it was during this short six years of Edward's reign that the Church of England was established as a Protestant church. There was a great influx of preachers from the continent. Uh, men such as Martin Bucer from Strasbourg, Peter Martyr the Gimiglia, Cramer appointed as Regis Professors of Theology at Cambridge and Oxford. These men were not just Protestants. They were Reformed. They were Calvinistic. This meant that when Cramer wrote and revised the prayer book, his theological consultants were Calvinist. The Church of England, uh, I like the way that Pastor Gray puts it, aboriginally is Calvinistic. It hasn't continued that way, and it's a very mixed thing, but the foundations of the Church of England were very Calvinistic. Henry VIII's pro-Catholic heresy laws were repealed. New bishops were appointed, including godly men like Ridley, Hooper, Coverdale, many images were removed from the churches and priests were allowed to marry. 1547, the chantries were dissolved. Does anyone know what a chantry was? A chantry was a place set up and funded by a patron so that a priest could offer mass and prayers for the departed and the dead. It was a lucrative thing for the priest because all he had to do was offer mass several times a day or multiple times a day, and he was paid well. There was over 2,000 of these spread out through England. They were all closed down. 1549 came the publication of the first edition of the book Common Prayer. It was written by Thomas Cranmer. With this book, Cranmer began to move the Anglican Church away from Catholic doctrines on communion, Steps continued by the second edition in 1552. This edition showed the influence of Martin Bucer, who had arrived at uh, Cambridge at this time. Gone was the language of the altar, mass, and priests. Instead, we read of the table, communion, and ministers. Clerical vestments were banned. The adoration of the bread and wine was condemned as specifically idolatrous. Uh, I'm assuming in the Catholic Church in Mass still today, they elevate the bread and they elevate the wine. Well, that's making an idol out of them. That was forbidden. Prayers for the dead were forbidden. 
1552, Cranmer introduced the 42 articles. In time, with some revision, these would become what we know today as the 39 articles of religion. These remained the foundation of the Church of England, although for long years now, they've been ignored by most people in authority. Isn't that something? You can have a founding document, but you're allowed to wink. Say, yeah, I agree with it, with a wink, and then you go on another way. Uh, there's a story about the Abstract of Principles, which was written in 1856, was adopted as the founding document of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And when Dr. Mola came in in 1993 as president, he said, we're all going to affirm this. And they've said, oh, we've affirmed it. He said, no, you're going to affirm it and say that you believe everything that's in it. He replaced 96 professors in two years because they could not affirm the abstract of principles. That's why you have confessions of faith and statements such as that. That's just really why you have it. Um, six years of Edward's reign. Here's another picture of the young man. That's the way he signed his name. Six years of his reign represented a time of tremendous flourishing and the English Protestantism. There was resistance to the new religion. Cornwell, some people objected, and uh, possibly because they spoke Cornish and they didn't understand the English of what was being said. In Norfolk, people resisted. They wanted greater reform. They had read and heard of what was going on uh, on the continent, and they wanted to see that in England. There was a great popular enthusiasm for the new movement in some regions. Overall, the Church of England was more thoroughly reformed in 1553 than at any other time before or since. But in one of the Lord's strange acts of providence, Henry dies. At age 16, he dies. And he knew what was going to happen. He knew what was going to happen. He knew that his half-sister Mary was coming to the throne. J.C. Ryle reports that on Edward's deathbed, he prayed, O Lord God, defend this realm from papistry and maintain thy true religion. His sister, Mary Tudor. Mary was the daughter of Catherine of Aragon and Henry VIII. What had happened to her mother? She was divorced by the king. She was Catholic. She detested the Protestants. She detested her father. She marries uh, Philip from Spain or somewhere like that. I don't know where he was from. She comes to the throne. Uh, She only reigned for five years. I didn't mention Lady Jane Grey. We'll talk about her maybe later. She reigned for five years. She did all she could to bring England back under the authority of the Pope. She had Parliament repeal all they had ordered in laws. She banished the Book of Common Prayer. She restored the feast days of the saints. She ordered Mary clergy to dismiss their wives. November 1554, a man named Reginald Pole, P-O-L-E, became the New Archbishop of Canterbury and papal's representative. He absolved England of schism, welcomed England back into the embrace of Rome. Pole had a personal grudge against the Protestants because Henry had had the majority of Pole's family killed. These were brutal times. Uh, Many Protestants, fearing reprisal if they refused to submit to the Pope, fled to the continent. This, no doubt, spared many lives. One who fled was John Knox from Scotland, who was in London. We will not be able to talk about Knox. How you do church history without John Knox is a travesty and an abomination, but that's what we will do. One particular focus of Mary and uh, Archbishop Pole was the Catholic Mass. This was the one very public means of demonstrating loyalty to the old religion. Consider for a moment that you had become a Protestant Christian. You knew the grace of God. You now were required to attend Mass under the new 
Queen Mary, what would you do? That's one reason that John Bradford wrote from prison a powerful word of encouragement to fearful Protestants entitled, The Hurt of Hearing Mass. It was a call to stand firm and not compromise. We know, brethren, who are facing this today. This is not ancient history. This is current events for some of our brethren. Most of you received the email two nights ago about the situation in the Far East right now. They are facing as much pressure as these young Protestant believers faced in England. Consider for a moment how fleeting is earthly security. The freedom and prosperity that the Protestants enjoyed under Edward was snatched away and it was replaced by grievous trials all in a matter of weeks. We must thank God for the freedom and peace, but we must not assume that it will endure forever. Remember, our hope is set on another country, Hebrews 11. Mary began her infamous burnings in early 1555. She targeted faithful Protestants who would not recant. And some and all, some 300 people were executed at the queen's direction. Most of the martyrs were common people, farmers, uh, shopkeepers. I think uh, Dr. Needham, Nick Needham, puts in his book, he says, Most of the martyrs were obscure, ordinary men and women whose often triumphant deaths revealed an unsuspected depth of grassroots Protestant faith. But some were not obscure. Some were prominent, prominent, such as bishops Nicholas Ridley, Hugh Latimer, and Nicholas Ridley. I uh, got the order out of here a little bit. Um, Ridley, as Bishop of London, was a brilliant theological mind. Latimer was an extraordinary and beloved preacher. I wish I could read you some of his sermons. Oh, it it is some great stuff. They soon incurred the wrath of Mary, who sentenced them to be burned together at the stake in Oxford, October 16, 1555. While in prison and pondering their awaiting fate, Latimer sent a moving letter to Ridley. By the way, let me take a moment. Lucy and I were married in 1969. We honeymooned in Williamsburg, Virginia. And as was a custom for all of us Piedmont boys at that time, we scoured antique stores looking for books. Things had not been republished. I mean, we were, we were looking for books. I found a six-volume set called Richmond's English Reformers. Um, this uh, six volumes was the gathered writings of Reverend Lay Richmond, who was on, he was ordained in 1797, he was assigned to two churches on the Isle of Wight, which, if you know anything about geography, is a very isolated place. He spent the next six to eight years gathering materials. And when he goes to London, he ends up publishing six volumes on the history of the Reformation. This is first edition stuff. Uh, these books were published in 1817. This was acquired by someone in 1833. And by me in 1969. But I've got six of the volumes. You can come look at them if you'd like to. And, and, and what I'm reading here from Latimer and Ridley uh, is contained in these books. It's phenomenal, phenomenal stuff. And it the cover's pretty? Or whatever you call that in there. Latimer sent a letter to Ridley. There is no remedy but patience. Better it is to suffer what cruelty they will put upon us than to incur God's indignation. Wherefore, be of good cheer in the Lord with due consideration what he requireth of you, what he doth promise you. A common enemy shall do no more than God will permit him. Wow. Our common enemy will do no more than God will permit him. God is faithful which will not suffer us to be tempted above our strength. They kept their resolve to the very end, 
as the executioner tied Latimer and Ridley to the stake back to back, brought the torch near, Latimer turned to his friend, and he uttered his last, Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day, by God's grace, light such a candle in England as I trust shall never be put out. That is a woodcut of an imagining what that would be. They were bound. I don't know how good you can see it. They were bound, uh, tied uh, with this there, back to back. Um, Cranmer died fast. You read the account of Latimer, which is in this book here, and in Fox's Book of Martyrs. And I don't want to gross anyone out, but they didn't do the faggots right or whatever. And it burned his nether parts, but without burning his upper parts. So he was still conscious when his legs had been consumed. But through it all, he pledged his faith and asked God to receive his soul. He didn't recant. Beautiful. As heirs to this legacy of faith, may we be worthy of our examples, their examples. Mary's murderous rampage was not yet through. Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, was next. He was the one that wrote the Book of Common Prayer. Um, he had in, been in prison. He wouldn't swear allegiance to Rome. He'd watched his friends, Ridley and Latimer, go to the stake. Mary may have also had a personal vendetta against Cranmer because he was the one who had sought the annulment of her mother, Catherine's marriage to King Henry. Not content to merely imprison or even martyr Cranmer, the queen sought to make an example of this prominent leader by forcing him to recant his Protestant convictions. This is sad and encouraging at the same time. Under extreme duress and for uncertain reasons, Cranmer finally signed a recantation, which Mary's realm gladly, gleefully published and circulated throughout England, and which reportedly caused great distress to many Protestants. This hardly spared the poor bishop's life, however, as he still received a death sentence. The old and courageous churchman was not yet through, however, before his execution, which took place at St. Mary's Church in Oxford, just a stone's throw from where Ridley and Latimer had died, Cranmer was called on to speak. After confessing his own sins and weaknesses, he repented of his, in, of his recantations. My words were written contrary to the truth which I thought in my heart and written for fear of death to save my life if it might be. And for as much as I have written many things contrary to what I believe in my heart, my hand shall first be punished. For if I may come to the fire, it shall be burned. As for the Pope, I refuse him for Christ's enemy and Antichrist with all his false doctrine. At the fire that day, it is said, and, and Bishop Ryle writes about Cranmer. Uh, as the flames crept toward him, he extended his offending hand, held it steady in the fire. Bishop Brow says, nothing in all his life became him so well as the manner of his leaving it. Greatly he had sinned, but greatly he had repented. That, beloved, is an encouraging thing to consider. Thankfully, we would say, uh, Mary dies. She'd never been in good health. Her sister, her half-sister, Elizabeth, came to the throne. Elizabeth, the second daughter of Henry VIII and the first of Anne Boleyn, was the half-sister of Mary. The Emperor Charles V on the continent had repeatedly urged Mary to have Elizabeth killed and thus removed from being heir of the throne. But Bloody Mary had not gone that far. We don't know why. We do know God restrained her hand. Following Elizabeth's coronation, the act of supremacy was reenacted. The Pope repudiated 
And with an act of uniformity, Cranmer's second prayer book was reinstated or reinstalled as the standard for the English church. Joyous Protestants began to return to England from their European exile. Some of them, some of the Protestants who had gone to Europe, took refuge in Frankfurt. And something happened in Frankfurt that is uh, telling to what's going to happen in England. In Frankfurt, there were a congregation of English speakers, and there were two men who ended up leading them, John Knox and Richard Cox. They were divided into two camps, Knoxians and Coxians. The uh, followers of John Knox wanted to pursue further and deeper reform. They wanted to reform the liturgy and the practices of the church. The followers of Richard Cox wanted to stick with the liturgy of King Edward. Frankfurt, uh, they divided. Elizabeth now appointed a series of new bishops when all but one of Mary's bishops resigned. Out of the 25 bishops, 17 were returning exiles. Very few were Noxians. The new bishops were mainly Coxians. Um, That means they wanted to, in a sense, maintain the status quo. This gives a little glimpse into Elizabeth's rather ambiguous religious views. On the one hand, Elizabeth had told the Spanish ambassador that she wanted the restoration of Henry's religion. On the other hand, she probably was a moderate Protestant. She was raised in an evangelical and humanistic atmosphere. Catherine Parr, Henry's last wife, was the lady that really raised Elizabeth. Elizabeth read the New Testament in Greek every day. She did choose to walk out of church when the minister elevated the bread and the wine. Overall, though, she was very reluctant to take Protestantism very far. The 39 Articles of Religion were ratified in 1571. They were never again to be amended, either by Elizabeth, her heirs, or successors. Almost certainly this would have horrified Cranmer because he saw them as a step along the road to Reformation, but not to the end of the road. The Puritans and later followers of the Puritans would wish for development and clarification of the Articles. This con- you contrast the Articles with the Westminster Confession of Faith, which was published in, uh, 15, in uh, 1646, and it's, it's amazing. Elizabeth's main priority, though, as I've put in the notes, was restoring and maintaining national unity. Her main purpose was to maintain this unity. She said there's only one Christ, Jesus, one faith, all else is a dispute over trifles. I have no desire to make windows into man's souls. She doesn't, didn't really care how much you personally believed. She just wanted you to be a good, I would put it in our terms, a good cultural Christian. She would have recognized uh, moralistic, therapeutic theism uh, really good. She gave us the Elizabethan settlement in which the Reformation process within the Church of England was essentially frozen. Sometimes it's known as the media or the middle way in which doctrinal questions and disputes were not to be settled in a distinctly reformed way as would be the case in reformed churches on the continent. To some extent, this remains true and is the essence of Anglicanism today. They tolerate candles, priestly robes. They have willingness to live with slight doctrinal ambiguities even within the 39 articles of the Church of England. There was opposition to Elizabethan, Elizabeth's settlement. Oh, that's a picture of her in later days. Uh, I, okay, I forget what I put up here. Um, there you go. Elizabeth had opposition from Catholics. Early on, she put some Catholics to, sit, to death for dissent from the throne. I, I wish that she had not done that. I don't think Protestants should have responded to their persecution by persecuting the Catholics. Elizabeth's cousin, Mary, Queen of Scots, had been forced out of Scotland 1563 or 65, I think it was. Mary had her imprisoned in the Tower of London. Some have said that she was a threat because Catholic uprisings in the country always wanted to free Mary and make her queen of England and Scotland. 
Finally, I think it was 1584 that she had to have, 1587, she had Mary, Queen of Scots, executed. There was covert and popular Roman Catholicism, and she was a threat to the throne. 1570, the Pope excommunicated Elizabeth in his papal bull, Regnus in Excelsis. This is a key date in the history of Roman Catholic reaction to Protestant England. From here on, English Catholics were required to oppose Elizabeth and seek her removal. They had to choose whether to be a good Catholic, but that's being a traitor. From here grew the strong sense among ordinary English people that there was something unsound about their Catholic neighbors. That animosity lasted for centuries. It lasts today in Ireland. This was reinforced, this animosity was reinforced by events like the Spanish Armada in 1588. If you know anything about it, it was a change in the weather that destroyed uh, the Spanish Armada. It wasn't that the English Navy was greater. English Protestants saw this as a hand of God in delivering England from Spain. This event was regularly celebrated like Elizabeth's own coronation. It helped to form a new anti-Cleth consensus. Opposition also grew among the Puritans. We're going to spend some time later next week on the Puritans. I'll only touch on them now. The Puritans are a much maligned movement. They're not a bunch of self-righteous killjoys. Some have described them as, quote, a hotter sort of Protestants. Overall, they were frustrated by the halfly reformed church of the Elizabethan settlement. Two moments in English history. 1560s, there was a a controversy over vestments. Elizabeth wanted to return the Roman clergy to dr- return the clergy to Roman dress. She insisted that Archbishop Pop- Parker enforce this. Many clergy refused. They lost their livings. Elizabeth asserted that in matters like clerical vestments, some said they were not going to dress up like a, a pope. Elizabeth asserted that in matters of clerical vestments, where adiphoria are secondary. The Puritans rightly responded that if such matters were at best periphery, how could they legitimately be made the subject of church law? There was a little glimpse of that. The Puritans, the Elizabethan settlement was the start and not the end of reform. It also illustrates one enduring difference between Anglicanism and reform thought. In matters of Adephora, the reformed sought to leave maximum room for freedom of conscience whereas Anglicanism had no principal problem with binding men's consciences, even in areas where Scripture does not speak. Let's be sure that we don't become cultural Anglicans and bind men's conscience uh, in the church in areas that are preferences and not clearly scriptural. 1570s, there were demands made for a twofold church government. There was one area of England in East Anglia, where they wanted a Presbyterian form of government to do away with the bishop. It's important to note that at this stage, everyone in the Church of England were still Calvinist. Arminianism had not arrived. Laudatorianism, which we'll talk about next week, had not arrived. These were thoroughgoing Calvinist people. Some became separatists. That led to the Puritans. Some became separatists. That led to the Baptists, our people. And I'll be able to touch on that maybe just a minute next week. But we can be thankful for as far as the reforms went. We can be thankful for God raising up Edward, for God raising up Elizabeth. Can we be thankful for God raising up Henry VIII? That's a little more difficult. But we have to admit that God used Henry VIII in the political and uh, ecclesiastical reforms from him to set the foundation for the Church of England, the Church of Owen, the Church of, well, I I won't name men, but it's a good thing. Well, thank you for your attention. I appreciate it so much. Tad Driver, would you close us in prayer, please?
Lord, we thank you that we are able to join together today with those who are like-minded. I ask that you would continue to use the men that we that you have placed in our pulpit, Lord. Give them wisdom. Give them understanding. Let our hearts and our ears listen today to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 